Hey guys, welcome back to another q and It is April 5th, 2021. Today, we have some good questions. Is there any data to support bikini figure athletes to waist trainers in order to A, create a smaller waist, B, bring in abs by sweating off the fat in the area? I'm open-minded individuals, so your answers will hopefully justify my eye rolls to certain individuals at my gym. Please reread sentence with intended sarcasm. Create a smaller waist. I don't know about data. I really have no idea to be completely honest. So first off, pelvic bone structure would be a big part of your waist, right? You're not going to create that. I mean, that's, that's there. You're not really going to, you're not going to manipulate that. Secondly, you know, potentially like pushing the rib cage in a little bit, maybe. Could you wear a waist trainer enough to actually push your organs and your stomach and your GI tract into a more narrow fashion that's probably gonna like compact it and push things up or down? Yeah, I mean, you could, theoretically, if you wore it enough and tight enough. Whether that's good or bad, it's really hard to say. I'm sure to an extreme degree, it's definitely gonna be bad. To a smaller degree, it's hard to say. Bring out abs. Not going to sweat off the fat, but circulation and blood flow to an area could can potentially help with fat loss. Is that going to make it very site specific? I mean, that's like a, it's a really roundabout way to say, yeah, maybe kind of could very slightly help with some blood flow and circulation in that area and might help with fat loss, but obviously, you know, in the presence of caloric deficit and, and whatnot. But is it going to be to any degree that would make any type of difference? I doubt it. So your eye rolls are probably warranted, for one. Probably not gaining enough benefit to really make it worth your time. Verdict is uh, still out somewhere. Somewhere out there. SARMs for bikini competitors, especially Osterine. Well, Osterine is generally kind of the first go-to. Seems to have the most literature behind it. The appeal to SARMs would be selective androgen, right? S-A, selective androgen receptor modulator. The idea would be it's selective. It's selective towards the receptor sites and, and its activity is selective. Based on what I've seen in the literature, that seems to be mostly true in a dose dependent manner. As the dose escalates, that becomes less true. So for a female at a low dose, you know, hypothetically like five to 10 milligrams, maybe 15 at, at most, might be more site selective in terms of the receptors and the areas that it's targeting, the tissues that it's targeting, I should say. Would it be like a viable option? I mean, sure, I guess. It is gonna cause some suppression. I mean, pretty much all the lab work I've seen from it causes some suppression and your hormonal access uh, causes some dyslipidemia, so your lipids being skewed a little bit causes some of, some of pretty much all the stuff that a normal anabolic would cause. Again, to what degree? Well, it really depends on the dose, but that's also the same with an anabolic, like it just, Depends on the dose. But yes, in a very, very low dose, hypothetically, it could be a good option. Whatever category you're in, that's kind of up to you. Some may argue with that it's kind of overkill on bikini to use something like that. That's really just someone's preference, whatever. I guarantee there's plenty of people on low and high levels of competing that use those things and other compounds. And then there's plenty that don't. And there's obviously like a huge genetic variance in people and what they can accomplish without it and what they can accomplish with it and so on. So is it something that could be used? Yes. Is it safer than something else? Maybe in a low dose, is it gonna cause some suppression? Probably. Are you gonna like lose your period and all that jazz? Maybe, but I generally don't see that happen in a low dose. Those are kind of some key bullet points. All right, is there any data or studies that correlate one's ethnicity to one's body composition? I'm biracial, half, uh, half Mexican. I, I don't see her photo, so maybe half Mexican, half Caucasian. A majority of the females on the, oh no, Herrera or Esvedo, side of the family, I'm really sorry if I'm butchering that, tend to follow a trend of being rather short and very round in the belly. So is it ethnic? Maybe. Ethnicity also comes with certain cultural norms like food, right? Now, if we look across the board and look at foods, we can definitely see that's probably the biggest correlation between obesity or, or like differences in body composition between different races or ethnic groups, right? Secondly, genetics. So could these genetics be kind of like passed down over time and develop over time? Yeah, I mean, for sure, 100% possible. Um, and that's likely the case. 
that these races have developed a certain way for a certain reason over a certain period of time and they've ended up where they are now and they will always continue to develop in whatever direction they're heading and it might be but it's like small little bits over time right you and you can look at that so if you look at a lot of the data that shows obesity in different races you'll see that there are some that are very concentrated and but if you look at their nutrition you can see why would it be something that's like going to make it harder to lose fat or whatever i mean maybe if it's a genetic thing but i mean there's plenty of people in all races that have just shit genetics for losing body fat or gaining muscle or whatever but yeah um there's definitely there's 100 percent genetic variables there we can look at athletics i mean great example you see certain races that actually congregate towards different sports or different athletic abilities or whatever it might be and that's not i mean that's not by chance there are certain traits within those races or ethnicities that help them gravitate towards that and make them excel in those things so that's not by chance i mean it's definitely genetics what are some of the most important takeaways you've realized in terms of being able to extend growth phase for long periods over the past few years? Would love to hear what you've done to manage fatigue better and prolong your pushes. Also, someone says, second this question. I actually reply to this. I don't always reply to all of them because I don't see them all, but one thing to keep in mind on this is I have been competing for a while. First show was 2009. I've competed in like every weight class. I mean, I've competed as a lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, light heavyweight, hopefully heavyweight next time. I've definitely grown a lot. And I, there are periods in there where you see I've grown more, grown less. But time is one of the biggest factors. Like there was a stint there where I competed a few years back to back. Of course, I did not grow that much in that period of time. Maybe a little bit, improved a couple little things. I've made pretty significant progress on the last few years because I haven't competed or say like the last couple years because I haven't competed, right? I mean, that's part of it, obviously. Other things, I would say recovery. Recovery is probably the biggest thing. Recovery, nervous system wise and just training wise and just not training too much. Like I always felt like for my body type and the way that my body responds and the way that I like to train, I train too much. That was it. Uh, that was probably one of my biggest detriments is I just trained too much and it wasn't a lot like it wasn't a lot compared to what some people might think of as too much but it was just too much for me and I found that I respond better when I don't train that much so I have to escalate my progress somehow whether it's load or some way volume throughout the phases but I just don't but I'm not doing like six days a week or anything you know I did I did a whole stint where I trained three days a week for quite a while and it worked really well and and right now I'm currently four days a week and I don't really go, I never really go above that. So pushing food, not being afraid to push enough food. And that's going to be so different across the board because there's plenty of people that can push food right into fatness and it doesn't take much. But, you know, I found that I have to eat a lot, like miserable amount of food for miserable amount of time. And I don't even really end up getting fat. I'm just fucking miserable <laughs> pretty much. You know, it's just like, just keep doing it. But obviously I gotta monitor other things like trying to keep digestion intact as the best I can and monitoring blood glucose and blah, 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 all that stuff. My routine's also very, very good, but it's, all, it's always been pretty good. But that's, you know, that's a big one too. Like I pretty much get up and go to bed at the same time every night. I get minimum eight hours pretty much every night. It's sometimes more, a lot of time more. It's very boring, <laughs> but it's very progressive. It's uh, another thing is I don't jump ship a lot on stuff. Like I try, I try to do what I think I need to do and I stick to it and I just keep doing it. And I understand now more than ever because I've been doing it a little bit longer that people say like the consistency thing and, but they underplay that a little bit. They underplay and people are consistent. There's a lot of people that are consistent, but they just consistently do the wrong stuff. So that doesn't really help, but they underplay the fact that you have to do really really difficult things for a long period of time and be really uncomfortable for a long period of time to make good progress for most people for most people that aren't genetically elite or have good genetics for muscle growth that's often what it takes and a lot of my clients have found that out too a lot of the guys and that's even more so true with more advanced people right because they're they're getting further and further and further away from their uh, natural set point or genetic ceiling or whatever, right? A lot of my clients have found that out, especially a lot of my like male bodybuilders and stuff that are more advanced because they made progress, but they're really, really fucking uncomfortable for a long period of time. And I'm not talking uncomfortable like they're uh, supplementing or jeopardizing their health or something in that regard. They're just, 
it's just the food and the training and all that and it's just hard and it's also just like having to nail the routine and manage it all the variables and things. It's very much like the low hanging fruit, right? People just underplay that stuff and they're always looking for the next best thing. If I had to give one thing on there though, I would just say recovery would be the biggest thing and learning to recover better, not being afraid to take extra days off and stuff like that. That's definitely made the biggest difference outside of all my little rant that I just gave there. Recovery, 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 recovery. That's how you grow. Probably didn't give you any insights. Maybe it did, I don't know. <laughs> all right, I always find gaps. I say that too. I always find gaps in people's, what they're doing. Like I can, I can normally find a gap in there. Like, oh, we can fix, you know, we can improve this. We've got, we've got an extra three to 5%. We do that for a year, right? Big difference. So there's always gaps. You gotta find the gaps. Thoughts on muscle growth as a result of lifting more effectively as opposed to increasing via volume. I feel as though my loads and reps are pretty similar to what they were the past year, but I've been focusing like crazy on effective contractions and on blowing up. Yeah, I mean, but that's number one. I think that's number one with anything. And I think that's not to say that that is more effective than increasing load or increasing volume or some combination of both. That's to say that you got to do that regardless. So if you're increasing load or increasing volume or whatever, you should still be effectively doing your reps. You shouldn't be sacrificing rep quality in order to progress your load. I mean, a lot of people do. I mean, they do it all the time because it might be just because you don't aren't paying close enough attention and you're just doing little micro like little small adjustments in the way that you do things and over time your quality just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Yeah, you progressed your load, but your effectiveness went down. But that's not so much more effective, but that is a baseline for everything. So yes, does that mean you have to like go super duper, like you're pressing and you gotta like close your eyes and go super slow and like something ridiculous? No, you don't have to do that, but you gotta feel the target muscle working. And I think once you, once you accomplish that, you can get back to doing those other things better. So one of the things I actually do with some people, and it's not all the time, kind of depends on their skill level and stuff. We'll just do activation phase, literally like do stuff that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of progression built in, but it's just, I want them to feel everything. And we run that for a bit and then jump into like a more progression scheme, load volume, you know, whatever, right? And that's because until they feel all those things, what are, what are you really doing? Good question. Not sure if you can use this one or not, but here it is. Dessert consumption, both sugar-free and non, non-sugar-free, causing migraines for someone on thyroid replacement medication, Synthroid. All I can find online answer says insulin resistance is the culprit, potential factors, potential tests to have done, such as blood work, etc. Thanks. First thing that comes to mind, histamine response. So histamine, I was actually talking about this with one of my, my mentorship clients or education clients recently histamine and migraines very common so what is histamine so essentially so we know that histamine think of allergies right so histamine is there as like an immune response it's very often coupled with inflammation it's a very important thing but too much of it will cause issues right high histamine generally related to like allergies and things puffiness whatever you know whatever symptoms you get from allergies now you can have this from food as well. So you might already have like a semi high histamine load or you have some type of like histamine, slight histamine intolerance or severe histamine intolerance. Whereas your body does produce these things in response to things, but you can consume them via food. So uh, there's a lot of foods that are high in histamine. So if you already have histamines that are maybe a little too high and then you consume a bunch of these foods, AKA the dessert, and then you get this histamine basically like spillover and you're having all these symptoms. Migraines is a very, very common one from histamine issues, okay? That's the very first thing that comes to mind. So what I would do, and again, I'm speculating, what you could do is just go to Google, go to low histamine foods, find a, find a basic food list, try it out as like a whole base diet, see if that improves any symptoms, see if that improves anything like overall well-being just on a regular basis, and then try lower histamine desserts, again, reference the food list, See how you feel. That's a, that's the very first thing that comes to mind and probably the most obvious thing that comes to mind. I don't know that the thyroid medication's super correlated, maybe indirectly. Again, you know, there's a lot of things we could ask like the gut and the hormone profile and stuff, but I would just try the histamine thing first, see how that works. Now, insulin resistance as a culprit. Yeah, I mean, possibly if their blood sugar is going like way through the roof and they're getting a high blood sugar headache, maybe. I mean, you can, you could, but it would have to be pretty high. A couple, couple possible culprits there, but try out the histamine thing. See if that gives any relief. That, again, that's probably one of the most obvious ones that comes to mind. So 
All right. I think that's all the questions. Thank you for the questions, and we will talk to you next time.